Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia. <coughs> welcome to you, Jairam. We had the honor of uh, hosting you the last time you did that splendid book on Indira Gandhi. And I want to congratulate you on this brilliant book you have written. And um, half a century almost, uh, he died in 1974. And 46 years later, Mephistopheles in Savile Row suit. <laughs> he does deserve a book like this. And it's almost, you feel you're reading a book written by an Oxford scholar on India or something like that. Congratulations on that. And, um, <clears throat> you know, he just sent me the front cover uh, on WhatsApp. Venkat, this may interest you. Then I jumped at it and said, hello, come and talk about your book here. And um, we were to have done it last week, but he was traveling, I was traveling. But uh, warm welcome to you, Jairam. Congratulations. Um, in spite of your busy political career, you found time to write a book that needed to be written. A, a, a giant, an intellectual giant, even if he was cantankerous and all kinds of things, deserved a book like this. So tell us how you decided to write this book and what it was like to write the book and why did you choose this man and, um, you know? Well, uh, you know, Krishnamaran was uh, a very consequential personality uh, in the Nehruvian era. You know, I've described this as the Krishnamaran age in the Nehruvian era. From 1935 to 1962, for a period of 27 years, he was Nehru's soulmate, intellectual comrade, literary agent, a member of his family, a virtually a member of his family. Uh, and he was at Nehru's side at all critical moments uh, of Indian political history in that period. Uh, so, he is a very consequential figure, both pre-1947 and post-1947. So, that's one reason to write his book. The second reason to write his book is that Krishnamanan left behind literally, literally tens of thousands of papers, letters, notes, memos, uh, primary material. Uh, and I, you know, I have done, this is my third biography, and I don't believe in oral history. Uh, I don't believe in interviewing people because, you know, Indians embellish facts. We as a country, uh, we invent situations, uh, we invent uh, episodes. Uh, we, we are great fiction tellers. Uh, and, you know, they're notoriously unreliable. So I, all my biographies have been based on archival material. And Krishna Menon left behind literally tens of thousands of pages, which were not open for public scrutiny till February of this year. They opened for public uh, scrutiny at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in February this year. So that's the second reason for writing the book, that there was primary material. The third reason was that there were very crucial episodes in India's history, whether it's the partition of India, whether it was the making of the Indian constitution, whether it was Nehru's foreign policy in the 50s, whether it was the military debacle with China in 1962, uh, in which Krishna Menon was a very pivotal figure. And the final reason for writing this book, of course, is that after the uh, electoral loss of the Congress in 2014, I've had a little more time to write, to reflect, to go to you know archives. So to that extent, I have to thank Mr. Modi for giving me a little time. <laughs> Okay, um, you know, you, you um, begin with his birth and his college and how Anne Besant sent him to England and, um, uh, you know, how he uh, spent a lot of time. He was to go originally to spend just one year in England, but he stayed there nearly for three decades and um, even contested local elections and uh, somebody said that he was a... Uh, he was a good Britisher and a, but a true Indian, you know, something like that. And um, and he had a tremendous uh, role in uh, helping Nehru publish in England. And he wrote an introduction to his autobiography and uh, you know letters to Indira Gandhi and so on. Um, so can you tell us something about 
his evolution, you know, he, he kept the Indian flag flying in London. He played, you know, encouraged, um, you know, young people. Indira Gandhi said he made us work like slaves and, uh, um, you know, and more than 20 years before we talked about, you know, the materialization of Indian independence, he worked very hard and, you know, he made friends in the Labour Party and uh, he collected a lot of young people who are not Indian, but foreigners and all that. And, and he made them believe that, you know, they're helping him to achieve something big, it was very important and all that. And, you know, he has a, a, a bus and a street named here and, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, Amazing. Tell us something about his his years in England. He went there to teach in a school, and um, and then he, he stayed back. And India Club restaurant in the Strand, just behind India House, still is there. And there was a controversy. They wanted to uh, pull it down and build something and all that. You know, what was it like researching this in the British Museum or wherever? Well, you know, most of us Indians are unaware of the role the Theosophical Society has, placed, has played in our nationalist movement. In the pre-Gandhi phase of Indian history, one of the most charismatic personalities in India was Annie Besant. Uh, she was the president of the Theosophical Society. She was also the president of the Indian National Congress uh, for, the year for, the, for the year 1918. Uh, she took over in December 1917. Uh, and you know, she was, she was really the prima donna of Indian politics. Uh, Lokmanya Tilak was there, Gokhale had died by then, Madan Mohan Malavya, Lala Rajpat Rai. Gandhi had not yet ac acquired the supremacy status which he acquires only in December of 1920 in Nagpur. But it was the era of Annie Besant. Uh, and Jawaharlal Nehru, Motilal Nehru, they were all members of the Theosophical Society. All, in fact, all elite Indians uh, were enamored of Annie Besant. Because Annie Besant was this Irish woman who had come to India, made India her home, and was preaching to India the virtues of Hindu culture, the virtues of ancient Indian civilization. Uh, and saying, you know, what are all these Britishers, these white-skinned guys here, they don't know anything. You are heirs to a great legacy. So we, you must have home rule. And she became a firebrand activist. Krishna Menon was a protege of Annie Besant. Uh, he was discovered by Annie Besant, so to speak, uh, in Madras at that time. Uh, he was groomed by her. He went to England because of her uh, to teach in a school that had been started by the Theosophical Society. He went with George Arundel, uh, a great man in his own right, but known in history as the husband of Rukmini Devi Arundel. Uh, the great culture personality of India who started Kalakshetra, which is still very active in, in Chennai. So, you know, uh, Krishna Menon, uh, uh, as I said, is a protege of Annie Besant. He's, he's groomed in the theosophical movement. In fact, um, you know, I've, I've, I've used a phrase here, thanks to Gopal Gandhi, that Annie Besant, uh, took Annie Besant, she deserves credit for discovering two Krishnas. One, Krishna Menon, and the other was Jiddu Krishnamurti, uh, you know, who became the great, uh, the great philosopher who then abandoned theosophy in 1929, at roughly the same time that Krishna Menon also abandons Annie Besant and starts the India League. You know, after Annie Besant, uh, he discovers another mentor, and that is Harold Lasky. And Lasky is this professor at the London School of Economics. Uh, you know, he comes, Lasky becomes interested uh, in Indian independence because he's a juror in a trial. Uh, and, that, and, you know, the trial was very interesting. Uh, there was a great Indian jurist called Sir C. Shankaran Nair uh, who had written a book uh, on Jallianwala Bagh. Jallianwala Bagh had taken place in 1919. Uh, the army man who gave the orders was Brigadier Reginald Dwyer and the governor of Punjab was Michael O'Dwyer. And Shankaran Nair had written a book uh, in, in 1921 on uh, Michael O'Dwyer and holding him culpable for the Jallianwala Bagh. Michael O'Dwyer uh, sued, um, you know, sued uh, Shankaran Nair. And Shankaran Nair's case went up to London. And there was a jury. And the only juror uh, who defended Shankaran Nair was Harold Lasky. 
and this was in you know in the 1922-23-24 period. Lasky becomes very interested in Indian independence. He's a professor at the London School of Economics, and Krishnamanan is a chronic student. In fact, you know there are many chronic students, people who who don't leave academic institutions, and he was at the LSE for 10 years. Uh, in fact, he joined the LSE in 1924, and in 1923, Ambedkar had left the LSE with a PhD. Uh, so they didn't overlap. It's interesting, um, Ambedkar left when Krishnamanan joined, and Krishnamanan was there for 10 years. Lasky becomes his, um, his guru, his mentor, and Krishnamanan starts the India League in 1930, and from 1930 to 1947, he's a one-man army. He's a one-man army, and uh, there's a lady whom I've quoted in the book, uh, uh, Evelyn Darlington, who worked with Krishnamanan, who said that Krishnamanan would go to any corner of England and speak to a man and a dog in favor of Indian independence. Uh, you see, most of us Indians uh, have been brought up to believe that the Indian freedom movement was a revolutionary upheaval. Uh, under the leadership of Gandhi. Yes, it was a peaceful revolution. Uh, it was a non-violent revolution. But the Indian freedom movement was also the product of negotiations between India uh, and Britain, particularly between India and the Labour Party. And the man who made these negotiations possible was Krishnamayana, through his links with Lasky and Stafford Cripps, and of course, because of Nehru's own charisma and his personal... Uh, Gandhi was a... Gandhi was the face of Indian nationalism in India, but the face of Indian nationalism globally was Nehru. Uh, and with Nehru, after 1935, there was Krishnamanan. So Krishnamanan really, there were many groups uh, uh, fighting, agitating for India's in independence, but Krishnamanan becomes the, the, you know, the lead campaigner, the lead agitator, because of his special links uh, with Nehru. And he's recognized by that, uh, by the Labour Party. He's a member of the Labour Party, by the way. So he makes the idea of Indian independence acceptable to the Labour Party. He would speak to trade unions, he would speak to student organizations, he would speak to social clubs, like the Theosophy clubs, he would speak to women's clubs. He was a great favorite of women's clubs. And he would go to all parts of England uh, and, and speak to these women clubs. Uh, and basically, in the 30s, by the end of the 30s, the idea that India must become independent becomes firmly embedded in the Labour Party's agenda. So that's the role that he really plays uh, as an agitator. Uh, you know, he, he writes uh, letters to the editor, uh, he, he writes articles in newspapers, he produces pamphlets, some of which I have reproduced in the book, which I was able to get some old pamphlets. Uh, and he was agitating not only for India's independence, because along with Nehru, he believed that Indian independence has to be part of a global struggle against imperialism. So he was fighting for Abyssinia, the Italian invasion of Abyssinia. Uh, he was against agitating against the Chinese invasion, uh, of the Japanese invasion of China. Uh, he was agitating for the freedom of the West Indies. Uh, and most importantly, most important issue that defined politics in the 1930s was uh, the civil war in Spain. Uh, you know, the fight between the Republicans and Franco's forces. So this was Krishnamanan. Uh, he got degree after degree. After 10 years, he got three degrees. Almost got a PhD. Uh, he got three degrees, uh, one in economics, one in political thought, and one in education. Uh, he became a lawyer, uh, but he was not a great lawyer. Uh, the, you know, he was not, not somebody who can be said to be a distinguished lawyer. However, one case uh, for which he has become immortal is that he was the lawyer for Udham Singh, uh, whose trial comes up in 1940. Udham Singh, as you know, was the man who actually pulled the trigger. Uh, you know, and killed um, Dwyer. Uh, so that was the, uh, you know, that was the whole uh, experience as far as he was concerned, uh, as far as the, the bar was concerned. He becomes a municipal councillor. Uh, he serves as a municipal councillor for St. Pancras uh, up to 1947 till he becomes high commissioner. 
uh, very successful uh, and his he had a one line when he became municipal co commissioner uh, he saw many pubs uh, in his borough and he said i don't want too many pubs i want more public libraries so you know he is known as a man who he wouldn't be welcome in the foreign correspondence club you know if he said there are no pubs uh, he believed in public libraries uh, and you know the, the saint camden uh, art the camden arts festival uh, and so on and so forth so this period of 1947 venkat is really uh, a one man army uh, in fact it's a one man many women army because he had this extraordinary charisma which attracted young women a uh, young uh, struggling british women who became volunteers for india's freedom uh, and you know his life is littered with these young women some of whom with whom he developed emotional relationships as well almost married one and didn't quite you know take the final step but almost married her so you know i described the india league as a one man many women army which fought for india's independence till 1947 you know nehru was an unknown entity by the time krishna menon was already a famous personality and he was widely known in fact uh, it was menon who found a publisher for nehru's books and so on tell us about the the relationship between menon and nehru and how in spite of the loss to china in 1962 nehru really did not want to sack menon but he was forced to sack him uh and so you know this intellectual uh, i think the, the kind of friendship nehru had with menon was unique in the sense nehru didn't really have another person with whom he can intellectually interact and all that tell us about this relationship between these two guys it's it's really not friendship it was bonding uh, i don't call it friendship it's it's more than friendship it's bonding i mean they were um, they were communicating in ideas they were writing letters to each other uh, other than gandhi and indira gandhi uh, nehru wrote the maximum letters uh, to nehru, to krishna menon and i can tell you having seen nehru's letters to gandhi and nehru's letters to indira gandhi the number may be more but the length of each letter to krishna menon was the longest nehru would write four pages men and would reply six pages i mean they would just find the time to write these letters about issues spain netaji chubachandra bose gandhi they would dissect personalities they would you know they would discuss international and national issues uh, they would discuss personal issues Uh, Nehru writes to um, you know uh, Krishna Menon saying I am going through great mental anguish in 1939 and he says I am about to break down I can't continue uh, and he doesn't say uh, why this is so but then you know I have I've written about it saying that this is because probably we don't know we don't have any definitive evidence but probably it's because Nehru had not reconciled to Firoz Gandhi's marriage. Uh, with indira gandhi because firoz gandhi by the way firoz gandhi was extremely close uh, to krishna menon it was nehru who introduced firoz gandhi to krishna menon and indira gandhi firoz gandhi and krishna menon were part of the india league and indira gandhi actually writes and she is very nostalgic about her relationship uh, with krishna as she called him although krishna was uh, 21 years uh, older older to to her so you know it's a relationship which is really indescribable venkat it's a it's a relationship where you, you know you part i think nehru saw krishna menon as part of him and krishna menon saw nehru as part of him either i mean they were extensions of each other's personalities uh, you're right krishna menon helped in the publication of nehru's books nehru was well known uh, in in england but i think by the publication of his books he became even more a well known and i think because of krishna menon's constant badgering of stafford cripps of harold lasky of clement attlee uh, nehru gets elevated uh, in the british eye as the man whom they can negotiate with uh, and that's what really happens in the 40s so you know uh, it's an extraordinary relationship and in 1962 you're absolutely right uh, krishna menon uh, you know uh, was forced to resign nehru didn't want to let him go Uh, nehru was most reluctant krishna menon had resigned on two occasions krishna um, nehru did not accept his resignation finally uh, it required two people 
uh, to force Nehru's hands. And the first hand, the first person to force Nehru's hand was Indira Gandhi herself, who went to the President Radha Krishnan and said, you must tell my father that he must, for his own sake, accept Krishna's resignation. Uh, and the second one was Mahavir Tyagi. Uh, you know, uh, he was a maverick Congress MP uh, who would uh, very close to Nehru, but never spared Nehru. And in a Congress parliamentary party meeting uh, that takes place on the 7th of November, the morning of 7th of November, 1962, uh, around about 10 or 10.30, uh, uh, Nehru is saying, you know, I've got his resignation. I'm considering it. And Krishna Menon said, uh, uh, Ma Ma Mahavir Tyagi gets up and says, Aap istifa manzoor ki jay, agar aap iska istifa nahi manzoor karenge, aapko istifa dena hoga. And this was Mahavir Tyagi telling the great Nehru. And uh, the entire Congress Parliamentary Party, there was Hare Krishna Mehta, there was K. Hanumantaya, and of course the leader was Tyagi. And Tyagi basically told Nehru, if you don't accept Krishna Menon's resignation, you will have to resign. Uh, so I think this was, it was the most reluctant Nehru uh, who accepted Krishna Menon's resignation on the 7th of November 1962. Uh, and after that, of course, you know, Nehru is in his period of decline. He's not in the best of health. Uh, and Krishna Menon continues to live just opposite Nehru's house. He continues to have unfettered access. But the, but the, the old chemistry is not there. The old chemist, there is a Kamraj plan that takes place in 63 and we know really it's a matter of time before uh, Nehru passes away. And by then Indira Gandhi I think had emerged as a power center in her own right uh, and she saw Krishna Menon, her close friend uh, and the friend of her husband as uh, a handicap, uh, as, a, as a sort of a, you know, as, as, a, as a burden that her father is carrying, so it is better to have some political distancing, even if personally they remain very close. You know, you write at length about um, the 62 war and how Menon was let down by B.M. Kaul and uh, he had issues with Timaya and uh, the other um, uh, chiefs of the Navy and Air Force and so on. <clears throat> and you also talk about the, the Krishna Menon proposal, give and take, which was repeated with Thang Xiaoping and, um, you know, looking back, I think we are still doing the same thing. I mean, uh, um, now I come to current politics. If we were to implement what Nehru had suggested, uh, sorry, uh, Menon had suggested, what Thang Xiaoping also suggested, would the Congress have any problems? Um, well, in the current context, Venkat, uh, Krishna Menon would be considered to be a hawk in relation to Pakistan and a dove in relation to China. He always felt that we should negotiate a settlement with China, but with Pakistan, we have fundamental ideological differences. He deeply distrusted Pakistan, but he did not have that same degree of distrust of the Chinese. And all through the 50s, he was telling Nehru, let's do this swap deal. Let, let us recognize, let us, uh, the swap was basically, we recognize China in Aksai Chin and the Chinese recognize us in the Chumbi Valley. Give and take. We give something here and we take something here. This was resisted by Nehru's own cabinet colleagues, by Pant, by Muraji Desai uh, and by S.K. Patil, but mostly by Govind Vallabh Pant, who was very close. After all, he was the Home Minister. Nehru, by then, by 1958, is entered his, the period of his political decline. Uh, and Nehru, uh, Krishna Menon is not able to sway Nehru very much in this regard. Parliament is against any negotiated deal. Uh, the media is against any negotiated deal. Uh, and that idea of the swap deal dies in 1960. But it's very interesting that the man who opposed the Krishna Menon uh, formula uh, with China goes to Beijing in 2003 as Prime Minister of India and signs an agreement with his Chinese counterpart saying that we will have special representatives on both sides to negotiate a border settlement. So in other words, Atal Bihari Vajpayee opposed Krishna Menon from 57 to 62 but when he became Prime Minister in 2003, exactly did what Krishna Menon was advocating Nehru to do. So to that extent, I think events have vindicated 
uh, Krishna Menon. Uh, and in fact, we are negotiating with the Chinese, but we are not negotiating with Pakistan, in a way. So to that extent, you know, Krishna Menon has been vindicated. I think uh, the, the, the story on 1962 is more complex, Venkat. Uh, you know, he is held to be the Khalnayak. If there is a villain of 1962, it is Krishna Menon. You talk to any man today and you say, Krishna Menon, oh, the man who lost the war for us. I mean, that's the one line, and I think the truth is infinitely more complicated. Uh, I think as K. Subramaniam, Madhavan Kutti, uh, whom I, whose papers I had access to, uh, Madhavan Kutti has interviewed K. Subramaniam, uh, the India's greatest defense expert, father of the current external affairs minister, uh, S. Jayashankar, and Subramaniam has told Madhavan Kutti that, and which I had access to, has told Madhavan Kutti that the failure in 1962 was the military failure. It was, a, it was a failure of military command and military leadership and the political establishment got blamed. Uh, and you know, I have quoted that and I've expanded on that. Uh, the relationship that Krishna Menon had between uh, Timaya and Krishna Menon. Uh, Timaya, uh, Krishna Menon is blamed all through, but the truth is considerably more complex. Timaya was speaking out of turn. Timaya was saying things to the British High Commissioner, uh, which he should never have been saying. He was talking about Krishna Menon carrying out a coup uh, against Nehru. Extraordinary uh, statement to make by a serving army chief uh, against his own minister to a foreign diplomat. And uh, G General Chaudhary, J.N. Chaudhary, who, who was a top army general then, was moonlighting as a military correspondent of the statesman for 10 years and he didn't have official permission and all the, for example, the resignation of Timaya uh, on the 31st of August 1959, which created a huge sensation, was leaked to the statesman. The statesman was the only newspaper to carry the news of the resignation and that's because Chaudhary leaked it. I mean, here's extraordinary. Army general leaking news of the uh, Army Major General leaking news on the resignation uh, of the general, right? So, you know, even the army was playing its all its games. It's, it was not entirely blemish-free. Yes, BM call was a wrong choice. It was a wrong choice on the part of Nehru. It was a wrong part, choice on the part of, uh, of Krishna Menon. Uh, and I think a man who had no operational experience was sent to Sela and Harbak Singh had to return and Harbaksh was then became the hero of the 1965 war. So they made some bad choices, but to hold Krishna Menon singularly responsible for 1962, I think does flies in the face of the archival evidence, you know. Would you say that uh, in a manner of speaking, your book uh, um, tries to exonerate uh, Menon uh, because he was wrongly blamed for the debacle uh, in 1962? No, I don't exonerate him. Uh, you know, why did he give General Call all those powers? How can, how can you, how can he be exonerated? No. See, I do not vilify Menon, I do not make him. Menon, there are two types of people as far as Menon is concerned. People who think he's a god. Every Malayali thinks he's a god. Okay, and I will give you some examples to show how, you know, not, no Malayali knows that Menon had an important role to play in the dismissal of the EMS government in 1959. And the greatest champion of Krishna Menon then was Justice V.R. Krishna here, who was a minister in EMS's government. And the communists helped Krishna Menon to get elected as an independent candidate in 1969 in Midnapur and finally from Trivandrum, the same seat that Shashi Tharoor uh, contests from. The only difference between Krishna Menon and Shashi Tharoor is Shashi Tharoor can campaign in Malayalam, Krishna Menon campaigned only in English. Because that's the only language he knew. He did not know any Malayalam. And secondly, and most importantly, Krishna Menon was opposed to the formation of Kerala in 1956. Now if I say this to a Malayali, he will hit me. But that is the truth. I have reproduced letters from Krishna Menon to Nehru which says do not create Kerala because Kerala will become a citadel of communism. In 1956, 
50, the letter is in 1955 actually. He says, don't create Kerala because Kerala will become a bastion of communism and Tamil Nadu, an independent Madras, will become a bastion of separatism. So what he wanted was a Dakshin Pradesh, a composite southern state which had Kerala, parts of Karnataka, parts of Madras and parts of Andhra. Of course, that was a romantic idea. It did not sit. So anyway, that was a bit of a diversion. So the, 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 the question you asked me, I do not make him out to be a god. Uh, I do not make him out to be a villain. I just present the evidence, the written evidence. What do the files say? What do the letters say? What do the notes say? What do the archives say? Uh, I have not interviewed anybody for this book. Uh, I have not spoken to anybody for this book. I have gone strictly by the written record. There are some places where well, I have described Krishnamanin as suicidal. He would write letters to Nehru saying, you know, I am going, bye bye. I am going, nobody loves me. You know, nobody cares for me. He was, you know, he became extremely insecure uh, because the Congress party didn't like him. Because the Congress party thought that he was never jailed, he never was lati charged, uh, he never went on hartal, and he was sitting in London, and we are the guys who are going into jail and we are braving it out. So, you know, why should Nehru favor this man? There was a lot of jealousy as far as Christopher Menon was concerned. So, this book neither makes him a hero nor a villain. Even in 1962, Venkat, I point out that. Today, Krishna Menon is responsible for building the defense production industry in India. All the public sector companies, Hindustan Aircraft, Bharat Earth Movers, Bharat Electronics, the DRDO, they make aircraft. The first, Mr. Modi is saying, make in India, make in India. Krishna Menon was the first man to say, make in India in defense. MiG-21 came to India. The Americans were offering Lockheed aircraft. Macmillan in Britain was offering us the fighter aircraft uh, and the hurricane fighter, if I remember right. And Krishna Menon said, no, we will go with the Russians because the Russians are giving us the freedom to manufacture this aircraft in Bangalore, HAL. So he's, he's the father of defense production. He is the father of DRDO, you know, which has been recognized by no lesser man than Abdul Kalam, whom I have quoted. However, however, the fact is that you know, he, he worked havoc in the morale of the top levels, echelons of the army. He respected no system, he respected no hierarchy, uh, and that cost us dearly in 1962. Uh, and he was extremely insecure. Uh, he earned, initially, he earned a lot of friends for India in the global diplomacy. For many years, he was known as Formula Menon. Every time there was a problem somewhere, you went to Menon and he would give you a formula. You know, Korea, Menon. Suez, Menon. Cyprus, Menon. Algeria, Menon. Apartheid, Menon. Disarmament, Menon. So up to 56, he was known as Formula Menon. But after that, you know, Menon had this remarkable capacity of converting even friends into enemies. So this, his style, the manner of his speaking, uh, even when he was silent, he was arrogant. You know, some people are arrogant when they speak, but he had this remarkable ability of remaining silent but yet appearing arrogant. So he lost friends for us. He lost a lot of friends for us. The Americans particularly, uh, you know, uh, became very disenchanted with India. And when he masterminded the liberation of Goa in December of 1961, that is when the entire Western world began to lose faith in Nehru's foreign policy. Because Nehru was this great uh, disciple, uh, heir of Gandhi, preaching non-violence, preaching peace, but he goes and invades Goa. The word was invades. Invades Goa, which is controlled by Portugal, which is a NATO ally. So Krishna Menon had to bear the brunt of international criticism. Uh, and, you know, uh, in fact, Kennedy made a very famous quote after Goa, after Goa became part of India. He was very upset that Nehru had not warned him. Nehru had met him in November of 1961. 
and this happened on the 18th of december 1961 so um, kennedy remarked to one of his aides which is there in the kennedy archives well you know nehru reminds me of a pastor who has been caught coming out of the whole house you know uh, it's a very famous quotation of, of 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 kennedy and the entire western world held not nehru responsible they held krishnan responsible because krishnan was then the defense minister of india you know one of the reasons why there was so much hostility within the congress party towards uh, krishna menon was apart from his intellectual arrogance um there was speculation that nehru was grooming menon as his successor um you know is there anything to that uh, there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that he was grooming krishna menon i don't think nehru ever thought of krishna menon as his successor uh you know uh, and um, nehru uh, in fact nehru never even groomed indira gandhi as to be his successor to be to be honest with you in february 1959 when uh, indira gandhi becomes president of the congress party there is a long letter that mahavir tyagi writes to nehru saying why are you doing this are, are you grooming her to take over from you and nehru responds to mahavir tyagi in great length explaining why indira gandhi uh, has been appointed not by him but by people like govind vallabh pant and lal bahadur shastri uh, and remember um, uh, venkat by 1959 the congress was a party of old fogies everybody was in the mid 60s and early 70s they were all the great freedom fighters they were all old fogies in 1959 Indira Gandhi was 42 years old. Please remember this. Today we are talking of generational battle in the Congress party. Go back, rewind to 1959. Everybody, Govind Vallabh Pant, Lal Bahadur Shastri, S K Patil, Moraji Desai, Swaran Singh, Jagjivan Ram, there were only two or three youngsters at the top level. One was Y B Chawan, and the other one was Indira Gandhi. Roughly. you know roughly contemporaries <laughs> rough com- contemporaries so there is no evidence to suggest that he grew <coughs> and i you know nehru was extraordinarily sharp he was aware of krishna menon's uh, follies he was uh, he was aware of his idiosyncrasies he keeps writing to indira gandhi and vijay lakshmi pandit that you know don't think that i am in love with him i know what his faults are but if he can be made to work for the country it would be a great benefit see one greatness of nehru which i don't find in many politicians nehru was a great man it's easy to be a great man but nehru was a good man it's very difficult to be a good man you know in today's politics there are some people who claim to be great but none none of those people who claim to be great can be called good or noble so nehru never saw the negative side of people Nehru saw only the positive side of people, and he saw ne- uh, Krishna Menon's intellect, Krishna Menon's dynamism, Krishna Menon's, you know, ability to solve problems. To him, that was primary. Everything else was secondary. You know, I think good men have this weakness; they cannot see the bad in other people. <laughs> um, you know, Indira Gandhi, when Menon died, said, "A volcano has been extinguished." and kps menon said but the glow of the lava which poured out so copiously and brilliantly from it would long remain in the memories of men and annals of history that's a beautiful tribute to a man like that tell us about do uh, you have a nice picture of firoz with krishna menon you have a lot of uh, lovely pictures congratulations i don't know how you collected them tell us about that but tell us about relationship between krishna menon and uh, indira gandhi but before i do that i must tell you that the 1950s the joke used to be that the government of india suffered from meningitis you know because you had vk krishna menon who was nehru's chief advisor you had vp menon who was sardar patel's chief advisor you had kps menon who was the you know foreign secretary You know, he was number two at that time, but he was a very important man at that time. You had K. P. S. Menon. 
that the, you had director of the intelligence bureau was T.G. Sanjeevi Pillai, uh, so man in a way, and our ambassador to China was K.M. Panika, who also, you know, part of the extended Menon, and you had P.N. Menon, our Shiv Shankar Menon's father, you know, so you had, and in fact, there used to be two jokes in, in the 50s. One joke, of course, was that the government of India uh, suffering from meningitis and the other one was if you wanted something done in the government of India you ran from pillay to post you know so you went so this was the era this was the era where uh, you know this this extraordinary Malayali network uh, you know control and I, I should not forget N. Raghavan Pillay who then became foreign secretary in the 50s you know after KPS Menon so you had uh, you had the Pillays and the Menons and the Nayars you know, controlling, and it's no surprise because they were highly educated. They were all foreign educated, virtually, very well trained, very professional, uh, and uh, they were very close to either Patel or they were close to Nehru, and therefore they got many opportunities. The relationship between Indira Gandhi and uh, and uh, Krishnamurti is very very interesting. They meet each other for the first time in 1936. Firoz Gandhi has met Krishna Menon before Indra meets Krishna Menon. Uh, Firoz and Krishna Menon hit it off on, like a house on fire. Uh, Indira, Krishna Menon, and uh, Firoz Gandhi form a threesome. Actually, it's a foursome. The fourth person is P. N. Haksa, uh, you know, who then becomes Indira Gandhi's uh, advisor and alter ego, on whom I wrote a book last year. Uh, and it was Krishna, and Krishna was considered to be part of the family. He was, he was part of the family. He was the brother that Nehru never had, you can look at it that way. Uh, he was literally the soulmate, and Nehru has remarked to more than one people that the only person uh, around him who had intellectual caliber uh, and who had the breadth of vision uh, was was Menon, cosmopolitan in his outlook and so on. So all through the 50s uh, and 60s, uh, Indra Gandhi was very close to Menon, very fond of Menon, but in 1962, all that changes. Uh, and in 62, you know, she forces her father's hand to accept Menon's resignation. And in 1967, the Menon has contested from Bombay in 57 and 1. He has contested in 1962 and 1. But in 67, the Congress party denies him a ticket. Indira Gandhi was very weak at that time. But S.K. Patel and Kamaraj were strong. They denied Krishna Menon the ticket. Krishna Menon leaves the Congress party. He leaves the Congress party and he contests as an independent, first from Midnapur in 1969. And uh, one person who translated his speeches uh, to Bengali in 1969 subsequently became the president of India, yeah. Pranam Mukherjee. Uh, and uh, in 1971, he becomes the MP from Trivandrum without speaking a word of Malayalam, as I mentioned earlier. He dies in 1974. Indira Gandhi keeps him at a political distance. It is Haksar who becomes the intermediary. Uh, because Haksar has worked with Menon uh, in the 30s. He has worked with Menon in the Indian High Commission for four years. Uh, roughly, you know, the same ideological ilk. Uh, so Krish uh, Indira Gandhi has great personal fondness. She keeps meeting. Krishna Menon keeps calling her. Uh, he calls her when he's about to die. He's dying. He's in Panth, Pandit Panth Hospital. India has just exploded its nuclear device. On the 18th of May, 1974, Krishna Menon is on his last legs virtually. He calls Indira Gandhi and gives her a dressing down on why India should never have tested this nuclear device and how this is a betrayal of everything that Nehru uh, stood for. And 10 days, 7 days before he finally dies on the 6th of October, 1974, he calls Indira Gandhi because the Shah of Iran is coming to India uh, and he's telling Indira Gandhi about the importance of Iran 
in India's geopolitical ambitions. So she's, you know, she meets him, she's close to him, uh, and she, you know, she, she knows about him, and she knows about his women. Uh, you know, he had a lot of women friends, a very colorful guy. Uh, yeah, she knew all about that. Uh, but after 62, she was careful. She was careful. Uh, she did not want to deviate too much, uh, you know, from the party line. And, you know, remember, the pre-69 Indira was a right of center Indira. The left of center Indira comes only after 69. Uh, so she was very particular about the Americans and keeping the Americans happy. After 69, of course, everything changes. The politics of India changes with the Congress split and so on. So th that's a very extraordinary relationship that they have. Very, very, very fond. There's a wonderful photograph of Krishnamanan and a young Rajiv. Yeah. Uh, you know, part of the family holding him. And uh, see, as I said, he's part of the family. He's very much part of the family. <coughs> Talking about men and women, it's interesting, of course, he attracted a lot of, uh, lot of young women when he was a young fellow in London. But Embo Mathai, <coughs> you refer to him in the book, he used to work with Nehru as his assistant. He claims in uh, his memoirs, uh, published when Mrs. Gandhi, after Mrs. Gandhi lost power, that uh, Menon saw that a lot of Defense manufacturers were trying to send pretty girls to seduce him and uh, he realized that and he got his personal doctor to issue a certificate saying that he is sexually impotent and he always carried that letter. Would you like to throw some light on that? <laughs> well, I think, you know, two people who should never be believed. One is Kushwan Singh and the second is Emo Mathai. You know, they can be read because they re write very well. But there is very little factual evidence for to back up. In fact, Mathai and Krishnamanan were close buddies. Yes, there was so much of correspondence between the two. My dear Mac and Mathai is writing back to Krishnamanan, old boy, stop drinking tea. Because you know, Menon used to drink this 30 cups of tea every day and he used to drink only tea and buns. And you know, they had a very warm, friendly relationship. Kushwan Singh. I've got letters from Kushwan Singh to Krishnamanan which give a completely different picture of Krishnamanan to the one that Kushan Singh tried to uh, portray in his, uh, in his memoir, autobiography. No, he had women friends. Women found him irresistible. He found women irresistible. So it was, you know, it was mutual. Uh, he was a bachelor. He was not, not, there was no guilt associated with what he was doing. He almost married only once. He had, uh, uh, I'm sure he had a lot of emotional entanglements. I have mentioned couple. Uh, you know, I've got a photograph of two of them. One was Kamla Jaspal, who worked in the Indian High Commission, and the, I have a picture of her. Uh, in fact, uh, Scotland Yard referred to her as the Queen uh, of India House, uh, and she was young, she was attractive, vivacious, uh, and you know, she and Menon were very close for four years. Then Kamla Jaspal got inducted into the Foreign Service. She was the third woman to get into the Foreign Service. She comes to India, she marries, has a child. Her son lives in Vasant uh, And uh, that was one relationship. He was very close to uh, a, a, an opera singer called Anna Polak, whose photograph also I have. Until 1972, he was writing letters to Anna Polak, uh, very close. Uh, he was very close to Barbara McNamara, whom he al almost married. Some correspondence there. There was another, um, uh, there was another uh, woman who was, uh, uh, you know, worked with him in the India League, uh, with whom he was very close, and whose son I was able to contact, who lives in Dubai. And he said, well, the story in his family was that his mother uh, and Krishnamanan had a brief affair for six months. But, you know, they worked very closely. Uh, in, the, in the India League. So there were women, you know, uh, in, in and out of his life. He had another woman called Janet Salamanca who worked in the UN uh, and they had, you know, they wrote to each other. Uh, unfortunately, Krishnamanan's letters to her have not survived, but Janet Salamanca's letters to Krishnamanan are available uh, at the Nehru Memorial. There are about 120 letters uh, over a period of three years. Uh, extraordinary, very passionate, very moving, and clearly shows that she was besotted with him 
and he was besotted with her. Uh, and you know, uh, he had this curious relationship. He occupied 19 Teen Murti Mark right in front of the Prime Minister's house uh, and Ramesh Bhandari and Ramesh Bhandari's family lived with him. So Ramesh Bhandari, Ramesh Bhandari's wife and Ramesh Bhandari's three children. Uh, Ramesh Bhandari was his private secretary. Uh, and it was, you know, a peculiar relationship. He liked kids, uh, he liked toys, and he liked walking sticks. You know, there's a photograph of Krishnamanan and his toys, and there's a wonderful photograph of Krishnamanan and his designer walking sticks. You know, uh, so he, you know, he had, he had women, he had relationships, but there was no scandal associated with it. I, I think Mathai was really bitter man, uh, and he took out his bitterness against everybody. You know, he was bitter about Indira Gandhi, he was bitter about Krishnamanan. But if you read the relationship that Krishnamanan had with Mathai, in fact, uh, in many ways, uh, Mathai consulted uh, Krishnamanan before he joined Nehru's staff. And it was because of Krishnamanan that he ended up being part of Nehru's staff. Uh, you know, see, the Malayalis were extraordinary. The, all of them were fighting with each other at that time, you know. Um, they all were fighting with each other, you know. V.P. Menon was fighting with Krishna Menon, Krishna Menon was fighting with Matai, Matai was fighting with uh, Raghavan Pillai, you know. So they were all, they all controlled the lever. See, ultimately, ultimately, Venkat, the question was, who controlled access to Nehru? Who had control of Nehru's mind? And Krishna Menon, it's very interesting, I must tell you the story. He writes, to Krishna, uh, he writes to Nehru in 1955, saying, do not constitute this new state of Kerala. Don't be taken in by this Malayali. You know who that Malayali is? K.M. Panikar. K.M. Panikar is a member of the States Reorganization Commission. And the States Reorganization Commission is recommending the creation of an independent state of Kerala. And here is Krishna Manan writing to Nehru, saying, bad idea. But don't listen to the Malayali. He's pushing it for his own interest. <laughs> so, <laughs> very, you know, what very interesting times, you know. Then ultimately, you, you wonder, Nehru is running this gigantic country, so many problems, and he's got all these guys around him fighting with each other instead of actually working as a team. It's very difficult, very difficult for Nehru to get all these prima donnas together. But the fact that he did, speaks volumes about Nehru's capability, patience, and as I said, ultimately, you know, if I were, if I were to write a biography of Nehru, which I hope to do uh, at some point of time, uh, you know, I would say the greatness of Nehru was that he was a good man. The greatness of Nehru was that he was a noble man. That was, I think, two characteristics of Nehru. Nehru was not devious, Nehru was not cunning, Nehru was not a politician. Gandhi was a master politician, master politician. And because Gandhi was a master politician, he was able to build the next level of leadership. Extraordinary, when you look at it. Rajaji, Bose, Patel, Gandhi, Prasa uh, Nehru, Prasad, Azad, all of them, men of great talent, men of great egos, but held together by this personality of Gandhi. And if one of them rebelled, Gandhi was smart enough to cut. What happened to Bose? Bose rebelled and Bose found himself out of the Congress in 1939. One last question from my side. You know, <coughs> Menon was once asked, why, why didn't you marry? He said, when cow's milk is available in plenty, why should I be stuck with a buffalo? <laughs> Have you heard this? <laughs> you see, one thing about uh, one thing about Krishnan, I must tell you, a lot of mythology about him. Okay. You know, there's a lot of positive mythology about him. There's a lot of negative mythology about him. So I have not used any of these mythologies unless there is written evidence, unless there is some written proof, unless there is some documentation, unless there is some corroboration. I have not used any of this. Where, where I have used these stories, he comes out well in some way, but he doesn't come out well in some places. But yes, he's one man. By the way, I must say that he was the most cartoonized Indian in the 50s. 
uh, if there were two Indians who were most cartoonized in the pre-social media age, it was Nehru and Krishnamanan. And you just have to open Shankar's weekly. It was every, also a Malayani, every week Nehru and Krishnamanan would be lampooned. And I have some of those cartoons here. Imagine Modi and Shah being lampooned. The lampooner would be put in jail. And, Krishna, and Nehru told Shankar, don't spare me. Famous words of Nehru. Shankar, don't spare me. Hold the mirror to me whenever you can. And Krishna Manan was cartoonized every week. He was the most cartoonized, most photographed, you know, most written about internationally, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, mostly negative. Initially, I must say one thing I must, I was telling this, this is somebody in the morning. In fact, Shekhar Gupta called me after he read this book and he said he didn't realize. You see, in 1955, Venkat, Krishna Menon almost did what Kissinger and Pakistan did in 1971, brought USA and China together. In 1955, Krishna Menon goes to China for eight days and secures the release of four American pilots who have been shot down and held captive by the Chinese government. He meets Eisenhower twice in a space of two months. And he meets John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, six times in the space of five months. And the whole idea was, can the US and China get together? Unfortunately, in 1955, that didn't happen because the Republicans were not ready for it. That same thing happened in 1971. What Kissinger and you know, Pakistan were able to accomplish, which is you know, bring the US and China together. Krishna Menon and China, in fact, Sheikh Gautam Prasad pointing out to me that he didn't realize that in 55, Nehru and mainly Krishna Menon was would have pulled off a real coup, which is the US and China. Imagine world politics would have been different had the rapprochement that took place in 1971 taken place in 1955. Um, questions, please. Um, yeah. Um, I had come here with one basic question, uh, but it's been partially answered. So I will confine myself to a couple of observations purely as a devil's advocate. I'm going to put my notebook aside. Um, you said in your afterward, there's a question you posed in the afterward. Um, was Krishna Menon made a fall guy? And uh, the only answer that you have said is that his uh, tenure had become untenable. Okay. Now, for people who have not had the benefit of listening to your address, uh, I should think would be slightly confused because what you have done at the end of the day is printed a picture of an absolutely well-rounded personality and um, including the penguin and the pelican thing and uh, the court of Walt Whitman, right? Uh, that's uh, number one. Uh, number two, not directly related to your book, but related to what you spoke about the freedom movement. Do you feel that the true story of the freedom movement has been written or has it not? You know, you drew a contrast between the political side and the, uh, what do you call it, the business side. Your thoughts on that? Well, our freedom movement has multiple strands. Now, the main strand was the Gandhian strand. You know, uh, and before Gandhi comes onto the stream, uh, clearly Tilak was the undisputed leader, and for two years, Ali Besant was the undisputed leader. But uh, they, there was the Bhagat Singh strand, okay? It's a very important strand in our freedom movement, which has not got the full importance that it actually deserves. Uh, the RSS claims that they represent a strand of the nationalist movement. I've yet to find historical and archival evidence to back that claim. Although my friend Rakesh Sinha, who is a member of parliament, tells me that he's working on a book which will point out how the RSS was involved in the freedom movement. I'm still waiting for that. 
so there is this Bhagat Singh strand. Uh, uh, so there are multiple strands, you know, and they've been written about in bits and pieces. Uh, but an integrated, and there is the strand of negotiations with the British Labour Party, of which uh, Krishna Menon is, is a very important player, uh, which does not get much importance in India. Because we like Indians like to think that the battle for Indian independence was fought mainly in India. But the fact is that the battle for Indian independence was also fought in London. You know, it was, it was being fought in India, uh, but it's also being fought in London, you know. So, uh, so it's a the overall picture, somebody has to really sit down. Uh, because people who have written about the Indian freedom movement have had deep ideological biases. You know, they've either come from the left or now they're coming from the right. Uh, and in this process, true scholarship sometimes it takes a back seat. And I, you know, I would say, uh, you know, I was a member of the JNU court last year. Uh, and uh, in the court meeting, uh, the vice chancellor asked some question of me and I gave the present vice chancellor, who is very much in the news, uh, I told him, I said, Mr. Vice Chancellor, I have only one thing to say today as a member of JNU court. Do not replace one form of tyranny with another form of tyranny. Keep JNU as a place of scholarship, of academic freedom, of liberal thought. Liberal thought does not mean only one ideological thought. Liberal thought means giving space for multiple. And, but de never devalue scholarship. Please place the premium on scholarship. But you know, he, he had a different agenda. So. Yeah. Raghavendra Verma from German Television said here. Um, sir, uh, before my question, you, the last thing, as you uh, said about the independence, everything being written about it, it's true um, as a school, as a student in school, uh, the history you read, and you just say, oh, British were bad, and whatever was shown on television, British were bad at this, and then Nehru and Gandhi fought, and India got independent. And it was so confusing, what did they fought? When they were bad, why peacefully, just by protesting, they left. So that aspect was never taught in school or even on television, Dudashan. It was the only thing at that time. Um, my question was about a biography. You said you um, has only taken the written um, portions from wherever they were available. And it was uh, said that um, many of the Indian uh, politicians, they do not uh, write to disclose, like it was the example of R. Venkatraman, when he was asked to write a biography of his time and he refused to do that because that might have exposed uh, maybe the powers, maybe Indira Gandhi or somebody who he, so there must be uh, very, uh, in India especially the, uh, these, written documents uh, must be lacking in, in size uh, to uh, have someone to be uh, making a biography as you did. Uh, how would you say that? Well, you know, Nehru and Krishnamanan belonged to a generation. Gandhi was another example of people who believed in writing letters. They believed in the written word. Indian culture is the oral word. There was no written Mahabharata. There was no written Ramayana. It was all the Vedas were not written, they were all handed down, right? Shruti, what you heard. And then that became Smriti, that what you remembered. Uh, so these people belonged to a generation, Rajaji, even Patel, not so much, but Rajaji certainly, and Nehru of course, you know, 100 volumes of the selected works have just been completed. And there are 100 volumes of the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. So they, they exposed their innermost thoughts, expressed their innermost opinions on people, on issues, freely and frankly. But they maintained these letters, which sh shows to me that Nehru and Krishnamanan were deeply conscious of their place in history. And they wanted some biographer, some day after they are gone, to come and why would Nehru maintain all these people? Why would Krishna Menon maintain all these? 1924, Mark Shee took London School of Economics. What courses he took with Harold Lasky, 
Why would he maintain all these letters that he wrote? But they have survived. And what? I mean, rooms, files. There are 3,000 files. And each file must be having something like 200 or 300 letters, notes, memos. Going back, the earliest in, in the case of Krishna Menon is 1924. And in the case of Nehru, it's 1905. So these are, Gandhi also, every small piece of paper Gandhi would keep. So these were people who were conscious of their place in history. And they knew they were making history. Uh, you know, they, and today we are living in the age of WhatsApps, emails, you know, we don't keep. It's very difficult. And uh, the fact is that these records, you know, are, they should be made. I am a firm believer in the 30-year rule that all records should be declassified after 30. I'm a firm believer. And just declassify. This is what happens in all other countries. I found, if you read the book, you will find shocking. <coughs> I found in the archives of Durham University in UK records of conversations of the British High Commissioner with General Timaya, which I have used. You will never get it in India. But I found it's there. General Timaya is telling Malcolm MacDonald, Krishna Menon is about to stage a coup against Nehru. A very serving army chief. And when I was interviewed by Karan Thapa, Karan Thapa's father figures in the book, because General Thapa, uh, Karan Thapa says, isn't this treason? I said, well, I've called it unusual, highly unusual. But if you insist on calling it treason, you know, it borders on that. Serving army chief telling the British High Commissioner that Krishna Menon is about to stage a coup. And he goes on to talk about what Krishna Menon does in the ministry. Bizarre. But these records are all available. You know, these, these are, I just sat in my room. I, and they're all digitized. They're all available. I paid, you know, some two pounds or three pounds per page. Uh, so they are available. Kennedy's Kissinger. Kissinger met Krishna Menon in 1962. I found eight page record of Kissinger's conversation with Krishna Menon at the Kennedy Library in Boston. So there are, you know, all sorts of archives which I have been, I got archives from China, archives from Russia, archives from England, archives from America. Uh, and of course, Krishna Menon's own papers at the Nehru Memorial. Uh, Jeram, uh, uh one hears that that was the period of scholar statesmen in Indian politics. Like, uh, and I am told that uh, Krishnamanu's detractors say that he was the biggest bad influence on Nehru on everything. The biggest? Bad influence. Bad, bad influence. Yeah, because that is one of the reasons why they were waiting for an opportunity to throw him out from that hallowed court. How do you respond to this? This is again a kind of, you know, what we, we all kept hearing when we were growing up. In you know, in 1953, the man who made Krishna Menon a member of parliament, from 47 to 52, he was Indian High Commissioner. In 53 May, he becomes a member of parliament of the Rajya Sabha from the state of Madras. And who makes him a member of parliament? Rajagopalachari, not Nehru. In 1957, February, Krishna Menon contests Lok Sabha for the first time from Bombay. Who gives a statement that a victory for Krishna Menon is a victory for India? Rajagopalachari. Of course, the same Rajagopalachari in November 62 says, country needs Nehru. But the country also needs Krishna Menon to step down. So views on Krishna Menon changed. Krishna Menon's closest friend in the 1930s was Mino Masani. There's a whole three chapters on Mino Masani. But by the 50s and 60s, Mino Masani had become his greatest critic. Because Mino Masani had gone from a believer in the Soviet Union to a complete, you know, free market believer in the United States. He was not a bad influence. I don't see, I think an influence that called for negotiations with China 
cannot be a bad influence. No, that's because again the socialist bent of He mind. was socialist, yes. Yeah. See, both Nehru and Krishnamanan were democratic socialists. There's a different, both words are important. We have a lot of socialists in India who are democratic. We have a lot of democrats in India who are not socialists. These two were democratic socialists. And this was a unique experiment in world political history. Most Indians don't understand what we started in 1947. All socialist countries are authoritarian countries. Period. India was the only exception. India set out to be a socialist country under democratic political system. They were both democratic socialists. No doubt Nehru was right, left of center. No doubt about it. He says I'm a socialist. But they were not communist. They were, they were deeply critical of communists. And somebody said um, to Krishnamanan, which, uh, which, uh, which I have got authenticated, in 69 and 71, he won because of the communist support. And somebody said, now this proves that you like the communists. So he's, he said, no, it only proves that the communists like me. That's all it is. It doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that I like them. It proves that they want me. So they, neither Krishnamanan nor Nehru were communists. They were enamored of the Soviet Union, no doubt about it. They were impressed with the Soviet Union. They were willing to turn a blind eye to Stalin in their fascination with the Soviet Union. They were naturally suspicious of America. They were more British. You know, Nehru said to Mahmoud Batten, you know, Dickie, you are not the last Viceroy, I am the last Viceroy you know, here. And Krishnamanan was described by his English friends, as Venkat said, a good Britisher, but a true Indian. That was, you know, a letter to the editor in the New Statesman. They were democratic socialists, absolutely, no doubt about it. And, but that was the era, you know, the era was one of socialism. Uh, every country, even the United States, you know, uh, was not market oriented in the sense that Reagan and Thatcher made it out to be. The British were certainly left of center. So, you know, I, uh, Krishnaman and, and Nehru represented a very important school of thought. And that was a school of thought that democracy, that socialism is possible in a democratic framework. And people don't realize that Krishnamanan played, you know, today everybody is reading the preamble to the constitution of India. It has become the fashionable thing to read the preamble. You know who drafted the preamble? Krishnamanan. I've got the draft of the preamble in the book. It has been changed here and there. But the first draft was done by Krishnamanan. Because Krishnamanan was a member of the there was an experts committee set up in July 1946 to advise the constituent assembly. And the idea of a constituent assembly came from Krishnamanan in 1933. 1933, Krishnamanan writes to Nehru. Of course, Nehru required no convincing because Nehru believed that we need to have a constituent assembly. But Gandhi was not clear about what a constituent assembly will do. But subsequently, Gandhi also changed his mind. And then the Constituent Assembly comes into force in 1946 and they write the Constitution. So these are all the unknown features of, of what Krishnamanan did. Uh, is it you know, good influence, bad influence? These are value judgments I have avoided. You know, I, you know, I don't, I've not got into that value judgments. I have just presented the record. One this is what he did. To go to? Moscow. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. He refused. He refused. Yeah, that whole episode I have discussed at length. He was, you know, Nehru sacked Krishnamenon. He sacked Krishnamenon. When it took nine months for Krishnamenon to leave, he was sacked. He, Nehru told Krishnamenon in October of 1951 
that you have to leave, take three months leave. Go on leave, you're not keeping well. By that time, the news of Kamla Jaspal and Krishnamanan also had reached uh, Nehru. And from October 51, Mathai is protecting, the same Mathai who called him sexually important, is protecting Krishnamanan in 51. Finally, Krishnamanan leaves only in July of 1952. So, yes, he, off he was offered vice chancellorship of Delhi University. He refused. He was offered ambassadorship to Moscow. He refused. He was a Britisher, yeah? He wanted to stay in London all his life. And in 1953, suddenly this offer comes of being a member of parliament and it comes from Rajaji, of all people. And Last question. <clears throat> I just wanted to know if you have based this book on your personal association with him or on material collected from archives or elsewhere. These are all from the archives and I have no special access. These are papers that are available in the National Archives. These are papers available in the Nehru Memorial Museum. These are papers available in all the university archives. I have given a list and you can have the same access that I have. Because I am from Delhi <coughs> and we knew him personally socially and also quarreled with him when he founded this paper, uh, paper Patriot. At that time we had to <laughs> approach uh, Lal Badur Shastri and Pandit Pant because he was collecting money from defense contractors and giving to Patriot. At that time there were other newspapers who were opposed to Manor. They wanted support from Lal Badur Shastri and Pandit Pant. You know this, and uh, you have described this. So there were differences at that time. But before that, we had a lot of meetings with him. He used to live nearby in apartments of DDA. So that is why I wanted to know how long you have been associated with him. Me? Uh -huh. No, no. I've never met him in my life. Because? I've never uh, met him in my life. Because By the way, uh, I must, uh, you know, you've raised a very important point that Krishnamanan was collecting money from defense contractors to fund leftist magazines. That's crap. That's, you know who funded Lincoln Patriot? Biju Patnaik. Biju Patnaik. It was Biju Patnaik who f funded, Biju Patnaik was a great leftist. Right. Biju Patnaik was a great Nehru Bhakt. And he was a great Krishnamanan Bhakt. And it is Krishnamanan who got Biju Patnaik. And there was one more person who funded, who unfortunately people don't remember, but he figures in this book, well, is Dr. A.V. Baliga, who was a very famous. Dr. Uh, Baliga was. Dr. Baliga. Main, main contributor. Main contributor. But the support was coming. But when this argument. I, I, that he is taking money from, this has been a propaganda by no. anti-Nehru, anti-Krishnamanan critics. No. That, you know, he fleeced the no. defense contractors. You may not, not, you may, not, you may not agree with this, but I am telling you with my personal meetings with Lal Badur Shastri, we had sub taken support from him and that was the, at that time. And uh, besides, uh, that is why I said, because I was the first, uh, we were the first persons to receive him when he came back from the United Nations. You know, he has given a, a long speech in UN at that time, I think 55, 56, something like that. And so we were the first to receive him with Lala Radha Raman, who was the president of Delhi Congress. So from that time, we have been very close with him. Thank you. Last Thank you. question. Last Thank question. you. Yeah, last uh, question, so I'll make it very short. I read, uh, you know, the review of your book by Manishankaraya last Sunday, and I rang him up. I said, sir, you have missed out on the most important thing, his role before independence, which I think needs to be highlighted by anybody who's writing the review. And the last part, which is very important because I'm an ex-army man, the army must know and remember his role as minister for defense production, you know, which, which they are not aware of. They're only aware of the 62 debacle, right? My only question is that in 57, I don't remember who he fought against in Mumbai, 
But in 62, if I'm correct, he fought against Acharya Kriplani and lost very narrowly because Pandit Nehru had to come himself and camp in Bombay for a couple of days to address a few meetings. Any uh, remark on that? You know, in 57, he never, sorry. In 57, he was a national hero because he had spoken for eight hours continuous in, on Kashmir. And there is a photograph of Krishna Menon in the book being welcomed by Kashmiris in Santa Cruz Airport. This was 1957. And Rajaji gave a statement uh, in 1957 that he must win. And his, his opponent was Peter D'Souza of the PSP, Praja Socialist Party. And Krishna Menon won very comfortably. In 62, he did not win narrowly, he won more handsomely. Uh, because you're right, Pandit uh, Nehru camp campaigned only once. He made only one speech. Krishna Manan campaigned only for 24 hours. He was there in Bombay only for 24 hours for the campaign. It was Baliga, Nutan, very nice photograph of Nutan and Krishna Manan, Raj Kapoor, Devanand, Balraj Sani. These were the people, K. A. Abbas, they were the people who campaigned for Krishna Menon, Rusi Karanjia, uh, who campaigned for Krishna Menon, and Krishna Menon won in 62. Uh, so he won handsomely. He won handsomely both the elections in 57 and 62. Uh, and of course, Kriplani and he, you know, had a love affair going from the 30s. You know, they were always at each other's throats because Kriplani felt that Krishna Menon had an undue influence uh, as far as Nehru is concerned. And also the fact that Krishna Menon was internationalizing the Indian freedom movement a bit too much. So, in 1963, when the first no-confidence motion is moved against Nehru's government in August of 1963, the man who moves the no-confidence motion is Acharya Kripalani. And Acharya Kripalani speaks for 90 minutes or two hours attacking uh, the government for neglecting defense and for underspending in defense. Krishna Menon is the last speaker from the government side. And Krishna Menon quotes from all of Kriplani's speeches in the 50s, where he's arguing that increasing expenditure on defense is an insult to Bapu. You know, that if, if we are going to spend more on defense, Gandhi's soul will be very disturbed. And that Nehru and Krishna Menon are leading the country up the garden path by emphasizing defense. So Krishna Menon quotes all that in his speech. So you know, there's a, there was a, between him and Kriplani, but there was a very good personal rapport. Uh, when he defeats Kriplani, unfortunately I couldn't reproduce that photograph because it was a very grainy photograph. Uh, Krishna Menon goes with Baliga to call on, Krishna Menon, uh, on, on, uh, on Kriplani in his house. You know, politics was ideological. Politics was not personal. See, Nehru had critics. Nehru had opponents. Nehru had rivals. Nehru did never have enemies. That is the difference between Nehruvian era and that is why Vajpayee became the figure that he became. Because he was a product of a Nehruvian era. Well, that was a splendid. Before I invite Munish to propose a vote of thanks, uh, <coughs> uh, Jairam, it was wonderful having you with us. As a gift of uh, a, a memento, we want to present to you. Thank you very much. Okay. This is a, we are 65, 62 years old. It's a specially designed uh, Not logo. 1962. No, no, no. <laughs> 1958 it was there. <laughs> Munish. Well, as usual, you know, you kept uh, the audience very enchanted, mesmerized and, and engrossed. And your freewheeling discussions are very welcoming and, uh, and fun always. So keep coming back to the Foreign Correspondents Club, you, Mr. Ramesh. And thank you all for joining us this evening. And, uh, and we certainly look forward to next prolific writing from you on Nehru. Thank you. Thank you.